Section 10 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lont. From 1635 to 1650, Part 3. By 1645, five mission houses had been established, with St. Marie on the Wye, east of Midland, as the central house. Near Lake Simcoe were two missions, St. Jean Baptiste and St. Joseph, near Pentang, St. Louis, and St. Ignace. Westward of St. Marie on the Wye were half a dozen irregular missions among the Tobacco Indians. Each of the five regular missions boasted palisaded enclosures, a chapel of log slabs with bell and spire, though the latter might be only a high wooden cross. At St. Marie, the central station, were lodgings for 60 people, a hospital, kitchen garden with cattle, pigs, and poultry. At various times, soldiers had been sent up by the Quebec governors till some thirty or forty were housed at St. Marie. In all were eighteen priests, four lay brothers, seven white servants, and twenty-three volunteers, unpaid helpers, dones, they were called. Among the volunteers was one short grosselier, who, if he did not accompany Father Jogues, on a preaching tour to the tribes of Lake Superior, had at least gone as far as the salt and learned of the vast unexplored world beyond Lake Superior. Food, as always, played a large part in winning the soul of the redskin. On church fete days, as many as 3,000 people were fed and lodged at St. Marie that the priests suffered many trials among the unreasonable savages need not be told. While it rained too heavily, they were accused of ruining the crop by praying for too much rain. When there was drought, they were blamed for not arranging this matter with their god, and when the scourge of smallpox raged through the Huron villages, devastating the wigwams so that the timber wolves wandered unmolested through the dead. It was easy for the humpback sorcerer to ascribe the pestilence also to the influence of the black robes. Once their houses were set on fire, again and again their lives were threatened. Often after trampling twenty miles through the sleek, soaked, snow-drifted spring forests, arriving at an Indian village foredone and exhausted, the Jesuit was met with no better welcome than a wigwam flat closed against his entrance, or a rabble of impish children hooting and jeering him as he sought shelter from house to house. But an influence was at work on the borders of the St. Lawrence that yearly rendered the Hurons more tractable. From raiding the settlements of the St. Lawrence, the Iroquois were sweeping in a scourge more deadly than smallpox up the Ottawa to the very forests of Georgian Bay. The Hurons no longer dared to go down to Quebec in swarming canoes. Only a few picked warriors, perhaps 250, would venture so near the Iroquois fighting ground. One winter night, as the priests sat round their hearth fire, watching the mournful shadows cast by the blazing logs on the rude walls, Brebeuf, the soldier, lion-hearted, the fearless, told in a low, dreamy voice of a vision that had come, the vision of a huge, fiery cross rising slowly out of the forest and moving across the face of the sky towards the Huron country. It seemed to come from the land of the Iroquois. Was the priest's vision a dream, or his own intuition deeper than reason? assuming dire form, portending a universal fear? Who can tell? I can but repeat the story as it is told in their annuals. 
How large was the cross? asked the other priests. Babeuf gazes long into the fire. Large enough to crucify us all, he answers. And, as he had dreamed, fell the blow. St. Joseph of the Lake Simcoe region was situated a day's travel from the main fortified mission of St. Marie. Round it were some 2,000 Hurons to whom Father Daniel ministered. Father Daniel was just closing the morning services on July the 4th, 1648. His tawny people were on their knees repeating the responses of the service, when from the forest, humming with insect and bird life, arose a sound that was neither wind nor running water, confused, increasingly nearing. Then a shriek broke within the fort palisades. The enemy, the Iroquois, and the courtyard was in an uproar indescribable. Painted redskins, naked but for the breech clout, were dashing across the cornfields to scale the palisades or force the hastily slammed gates. Father Daniel rushed from church to wigwams, rallying the Huron warriors, while the women and children, aged and the feeble, ran a terrified rabble to the shelter of the chapel. Before the Hurons could man the walls, Iroquois hatchets had hacked holes of entrance in the palisade. The fort was rushed by a bloodthirsty horde, making the air hideous with fiendish screams. Fly! Save yourself! shouted the priest. I stay here. We shall this day meet in heaven. In the volley and counter volley of ball and arrow, Father Daniel reeled on his face, shot in the heart. In a trice, his body was cut to pieces, and the Iroquois were bathing their hands in his warm lifeblood. A moment later, the village was in roaring flames, and on the burning pile were flung the fragments of the priest's body. The victors set out on the homeward tramp with a line of more than 600 prisoners, the majority women and children, to be brained if their strength failed on the march, to be tortured in the Iroquois towns if they survived the abuse on the way. Next westward from the Lake Simcoe missions were St. Ignace with 400 people and St. Louis with 700 near the modern Patang and within short distance of the Jesuit strong headquarters on the river Y. At these two missions labored Brebeuf, the giant, and a fragile priest named Lamont. Encouraged by the total destruction of St. Joseph, the Iroquois that very fall took the warpath with more than 1,000 braves. Ascending the Ottawa leisurely, they had passed the winter hunting and cutting off any wanderers found in the forest. The Hurons knew the doom that was slowly approaching, yet they remained passive, stunned, terrified by the blow at St. Joseph. It was spring of 1649 before the warriors reached Georgian Bay. March winds had cleared the trail of snowdrifts, but the forests were still leafless. St. Ignace's mission lay between Lake Simcoe and St. Louis, Approaching it one windy March night, the Iroquois had cut holes through the palisades before dawn and burst inside the walls with the yells and gyrations of some hideous hell dance. Here a warrior simulated the howl of the wolf. There another approached in crouching leaps of a panther, all the while uttering the yelps and screams of a beast of prey lashed to fury. The poor Hurons were easy victims. Nearly all their braves happened to be absent hunting, and the 400 women and children, rushing from the long houses half dazed with sleep, fell without realizing their fate, or found themselves herded in the chapel like cattle at the shambles. Iroquois guards at every window and door. Luckily, three Hurons escaped over the palisades and rushed breathless through the forest to forewarn Bebeuf and Lamont, cooped up in St. Louis. The Iroquois came on behind like a wolf pack. A 
escape escape run to the woods black robe there is yet time the indian converts urged brebeuf but the lion-hearted stood steadfast though lamont new to scenes of carnage turned white and trembled in spite of his resolution who would protect the women if the men fled like deer to the woods demanded brebeuf and the tigerish yells of the onrushing horde answered the question before day dawn had tipped the branches of the leafless trees with shafted sunlight the enemy was hacking furiously at the palisades trapped and cornered the most timid of animals will fight with such fury reckless from desperation cherishing no hope the hurons now fought but they were handicapped by lack of guns and balls thirty iroquois had been slain a hundred wounded it was only the lulls between two thunderclaps a moment later they were on st louis walls and had hacked through a dozen places at these spots the fiercest fighting occurred and those iroquois who had not already bathed their faces in the gore of victims at st nace were soon enough dyed in their own blood here there everywhere were brebeuf and lamont fighting and ministering last rites exhorting the hurons to perish valiantly then the rolling clouds of flame and smoke told the hurons that their village was on fire some dashed back to die inside the burning wigwam others fought desperately to escape through the broken walls a few in the confusion and smoke succeeded in reaching the woods whence they ran to warn saint marie on the y the Boeuf and lamont had been knocked down stripped bound and were now half driven half dragged with the other captives to be tortured at ignace not a sign of fear did either priest betray one would fain pass over the next pages of the jesuit records it is inconceivable how human nature even savage nature so often stoops beneath the most repellent cruelties of the brute world it is inconceivable unless one acknowledge an influence fiendish but let us not judge the indians too harshly when the iroquois warriors were torturing the hurons and their missionaries the populace of civilized european cities was outdoing the savages on victims whose sins were political while the jesuits of st marie were praying all day and night before the lighted altar for heavenly intervention to rescue brebeuf and lamont the two captured priests stood bound to the torture stakes the gaping stock of a thousand fiends while the iroquois singed brebeuf from head to foot with burning birch bark he threatened them in tones of thunder with everlasting damnation for persecuting the servants of god the iroquois shrieked with laughter such spirit in a man was their liking then to stop his voice they cut away his lips and rammed a red-hot iron into his mouth not once did the giant priest flinch or wreath at the torture stake then they brought out lamont that the roof might suffer the agony of seeing a weaker spirit flinch poor lamont fell at his superior's feet sobbing out a verse of scripture then they wreathed lamont in oiled bark and set fire to it we baptize you they yelled throwing hot water on the dying man then they railed out blasphemies obscenities unspeakable against the jesuits religion brebeuf had not winced but his frame was relaxing he sank to his knees a dying man with the yells of devils jealous of losing their prey they ripped off his scalp while he was still alive tore his heart from his breast and drank the warm lifeblood of the priest Brebeuf died at four in the afternoon. Strange to relate, Lamont, of the weaker body, survived the tortures till daybreak, when, weary of the sport, the Indians desisted from their mad night 
orgies and put an end to his suffering by braining him over at saint marie Ragino and the other priests momentarily awaited the attack but at saint marie were forty french soldiers and ample supply of muskets the iroquois were bravest as the wolf is bravest when attacking a lamb three hundred hurons lay in ambush along the forest trail these ran from the iroquois like sheep but when three hundred more sallied from the fort led by the french it was the iroquois turn to run and they fled back behind the palisades of st louis the hurons followed entered by the self-same breaches the iroquois had made and drove the invaders out more iroquois rushed from ignace to the rescue a hundred iroquois fell in the day's fight and when they finally recaptured st louis only twenty hurons remained of the three hundred the victory had been brought at too great cost tying their prisoners to stakes at st ignace they heaped the courtyard with inflammable wool set fire to all and retreated taking only enough prisoners to carry their plunder st marie for the time was safe the invaders had gone but the blow had crushed forever the prowess of the huron nation the remaining towns had thought for nothing but fight town after town was forsaken and burned in the summer of sixteen forty nine the corn harvest left standing in the fields while panic-stricken people put out in their canoes to take refuge on the islands of georgian bay st marie on the wye alone remained and the reason for its existence was vanishing like winter snow before summer sun for its people fled 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 daily fled to the pink granite islands of the lake the hurons begged the jesuits to accompany them and there was nothing else for ragueneau to do saint marie was stripped the stock slain for food then the buildings were set on fire june fourteenth just as the sunset bathed water and sky in seas of gold the priest led his homeless people down the lake as moses of old led the children of israel oars and sweet georgian bay calm as glass they rafted slowly out to the christian island faith hope and charity which tourists can still see from passing steamers a long wooded line beyond the white water fret of the wind-swept reefs the island known on the map as charity or st joseph was heavily wooded here the refugees found their haven and the french soldiers cleared the ground for a stone fort of walled masonry the island offering little else than stone and timber though fishing has not failed to this day by autumn the walled fort was complete but some eight thousand refugees had gathered to the island such numbers could not subsist on georgian bay in summer in winter their presence meant starvation and before the spring of sixteen fifty half had perished of the survivors many had fed on the bodies of the dead no help had come from quebec for almost three years the clothing of the priests had long since worn to shreds Ragino and his helpers were now dressed in skins like the indians and reduced to a diet of nuts and smoked fish with warm weather came sickness and also came bands of raiding iroquois striking terror to the Baco indians among them too perished jesuit priests martyrs to the faith did some of the hurons venture from the christian islands across to the mainland to hunt they were beset by scalping parties and came back to the fort with tales that crazed Regino's indians with terror the hurons decided to abandon georgian bay some scattered to Lake Superior, to Green Bay, to Detroit. Others found refuge on Manitoulin Island. A remnant of a few hundreds followed Ragino and the French down 
the Ottawa to take shelter at Quebec. Their descendants may be found to this day at the mission of Lorette. Today, as tourists drive through Quebec, marveling at the massive buildings and power and wealth of Catholic orders, do they pause to consider that the foundation stones of that power were dyed in the blood of these early martyrs? Or, as the pleasure seekers glide among the islands of Georgian Bay, do they ever ponder that this fair world of blue waters and pink granite islands once witnessed the most bloody tragedy of brute force, triumphant over the blasted hopes of religious zeal? End of section 10. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 11 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. From 1650 to 1672, Part 1. Having destroyed the Hurons, who were under French protection, it is not surprising that the Iroquois now set themselves to destroy the French. From Montreal to Tadoussac, the St. Lawrence swarmed with war canoes. No sooner had the river ice broken up and the birds begun winging north than the Iroquois flocked down the current of the Richelieu across Lake St. Peter to Three Rivers down the St. Lawrence to Quebec, up the St. Lawrence to Montreal, and the snows of midwinter afforded no truce to the raids, for the Iroquois cached their canoes in the forest and roamed the woods on snowshoes. Settlers fled terrified from their farms to the towns. Farmers dared not work in their fields without a sentry standing guard. Montreal became a prison. Three rivers lay blockaded and at Quebec the war canoes passed defiantly below the cannon of Cape Diamond, paddles beating defiance against the gunnels, or prows flaunting the scalps of victims within cannon fire of Castle St. Louis. Rich and poor, priests and parishers, governors and habitants, all alike trembled before the lurking treachery. Father Jogues had been captured on his way from the Huron mission. Pierre Poncet was likewise captured at Quebec and carried to the tortures of the Mohawk towns, and a nephew of the governor of Quebec was a few years later attacked while hunting near Lake Champlain. The outraged people of New France realized that fear was only increasing the boldness of the Iroquois. A Mohawk chief fell into their hands. By way of warning, they bound him to a stake and burned him to death. The Indian revenge fell swift and sure. In 1653, the governor of Three Rivers and twelve leading citizens were murdered a short distance from the fort gates. One night in May of 1652, a tall, slim, swarthy lad, about sixteen years of age, was seen winding his way home to Three Rivers from a day's shooting in the marshes. He had set out at day dawn with some friends, but fear of the Iroquois had driven his comrades back. Now at nightfall, within the sight of three rivers, when the sunset glittered from the chapel spire, he unslung his bag of gain and sat down to reload his musket. Then he noticed that his pistols in his belt had been water soaked from the day's waiting, and he reloaded them too. Any one who is used to life in the open knows how at sundown wild birds foregather for a last conclave. Ducks were winging in myriads and settling on the lake with noisy flacker. Unable to resist the temptation of one last shot, the boy was gliding noiselessly forward through the rushes when suddenly he stopped as if rooted to the ground, with hands thrown up and eyes bulging from his head. 
At his feet lay the corpses of his mourning comrades, scalped, stripped, hacked almost piecemeal. Then the instinct of the hunted thing, of flight, of self-protection, eclipsed momentary terror, and the boy was ducking into the rushes to hide, when, with a crash of musketry from the woods, the Iroquois were upon him. When he regained consciousness, he was pegged out on the sand amid a flotilla of beach canoes, where Iroquois warriors were having an evening meal. So began the captivity, the love of the wilds, the wild wanderings of one of the most intrepid explorers in New France, Pierre Esprit Radisson. His youth and the fact that he would make a good warrior were in his favor. When he was carried back to the Mohawk town and with other prisoners, compelled to run the gauntlet between two lines of tormentors, Radisson ran so fast and dodged so dexterously that he was not once hit. The feat was greeted with shrieks of delight from the Iroquois, and the high-spirited boy was given in adoption to a captive Huron woman. Things would have gone well had he not bungled an attempt to escape. But one night, while in camp with three Iroquois hunters, an Algonquin captive entered. While the Iroquois slept with guns stacked against the tree, the sleepless Algonquin captive rose noiselessly where he lay by the fire, seized the Mohawk warrior's guns, threw one tomahawk across to Radisson, and with the other brained two of the sleepers. The French boy aimed a blow at the third sleeper, and the two captives escaped, but they might have saved themselves the trouble. They were pursued and overtaken on Lake St. Peter, within sight of three rivers. This time Radisson had to endure all the diables of Mohawk torture. For two days he was kept bound to the torture stake. The nails were torn from his fingers. The flesh burnt from the soles of his feet. A hundred other barbarous freaks of impish Indian children reeked on the French boy. Arrows with flaming points were shot at his naked body. His mutilated finger ends were ground between stones or thrust into the smoking bowl of a pipe full of coals or bitten by fiendish youngsters being trained up the way a Mohawk warrior should go. Radisson's youth, his courage, his very daredevil rashness, together with presents of wampum belts from his Indian parents, served his life for a second time, and a year of wild wanderings with Mohawk warriors finally brought him to Albany on the Hudson, where the Dutch would have ransomed him, as they had ransomed the two Jesuits, Georges and Poncet. But the boy disliked to break faith a second time with his loyal Indian friends. Still, the glimpse of white man's life caused a terrible upheaval of revulsion from the barbitites, the filth, the vice of the Mohawk camp. He could endure Indian life no longer. One morning in the fall of 1653, he stole out from the Mohawk lodges while the mist of the day dawn still shadowed the forest and broke at a run down the trail of the Mohawk Valley for Albany. All day he ran, pursued by the phantom fright of his own imagination, fancying everything that crunched beneath his moccasin tread, some Mohawk warrior, seeing in the branches that reeled as he passed the arms of pursuers stretched out to stop him, on and on and on he ran, pausing neither to eat nor rest, here dashing into the bed of a stream and running along the pebbled bottom to throw pursuers off the trail, there breaking through a thicket of brushwood away from the trail, only to come back to it breathless farther along, when some alarm of the wind in the trees or deer on the move had proved false. Only muscles of iron strength, lithe as elastic, could have endured the strain. Nightfall at last came, hiding him from pursuers, but still he sped on at a run, following the trail by the light of the stars and the rush of the river. 
by sunrise of the second day he was staggering for the rocks were slippery with frost and his moccasins worn to tatters it was four in the afternoon before he reached the first outlying cabin of the dutch settlers for three days he lay hidden in albany behind sacks of wheat in a thin boarded attic through the cracks of which he could see the mohawks searching everywhere the jesuit ponset gave him passage money to take ship to europe by way of new york new york was then a village of a few hundred houses thatch roof with stone fort stone church stone barracks central park was a rocky wilderness what is now wall street was the stamping ground of pigs and goats january of sixteen fifty four radisson reached europe no longer a boy but a man inured to danger and hardships and daring though not yet eighteen when radisson came back to three rivers in may he found changes had taken place in new fronts among the men murdered with the governor of three rivers by the mohawks the preceding year had been his sister's husband and the widow had married one medard short de gracier who had served in the huron country as lay helper with the martyred jesuits also a truce had been patched up between the iroquois and the french the iroquois were warring against the eries and wanted arms from the french a still more treacherous motive underlay the iroquois peace they wanted a french settlement in their country as a guarantee of non-intervention when they continued to raid the refugee hurons such duplicity was unsuspected by new france the jesuits looked upon the peace as designed by providence to enable them to establish missions among the iroquois father lemoy went from village to village preaching the gospel and receiving belts of wampum as tokens of peace one belt containing as many as seven thousand beads when one onaondaga asked for a french colony lazon the french governor readily consented if the jesuits would pay the cost estimated at about ten thousand dollars and in sixteen fifty six major dupuy had left fifty frenchmen and four jesuits up the st lawrence in long boats through the wilderness to a little hill on lake onaondaga where a palisaded fort was built and the lilies of france embroidered on a white silk flag by the ursuline nuns flung from the breeze above the iroquois land the colony was hardly established before three hundred mohawks fell on the hurons encamped under shelter of quebec butchered without mercy and departed with shots that echoed below the guns at cape diamond scalps waving from the prow of each iroquois canoe quebec was thunderstruck numb with fright the french dared not retaliate or the iroquois would fall on the colony at onaondaga perhaps people who keep their vision too constantly fixed on heaven lose sight of the practical duties of earth but when eighty onaondagas came again in sixteen fifty seven inviting a hundred hurons to join the iroquois confederacy the jesuits again suspected no treachery in the invitation but saw only a providential opportunity to spread one hundred huron converts among the iroquois pagans father regano who led the poor refugees down from the christian islands on georgian bay now with another priest offered to accompany the hurons to the iroquois nation an interpreter was needed young radisson now twenty-one years of age offered to go as lay helper and the party of two hundred and twenty french eighty iroquois one hundred hurons departed from the gates of montreal july twenty sixth hardly were they beyond recall before scouts brought word that twelve hundred iroquois had gone on the warpath against canada and three frenchmen of montreal had been scalped at last the governor of quebec bestirred himself he caused twelve iroquois to be seized and held as hostages for the safety of the french the onondagas had set out from montreal carrying the frenchmen's baggage beyond the first portage they flung the packs on the ground hurried the hurons into canoes so that no two hurons were in one boat 
and paddled over the water with loud laughter, leaving the French in the lurch. Father Regineau and Radisson quickly read the ominous signs. Telling the other French to gather up the baggage, they armed themselves and paddled in swift pursuit. That night Ragano's party and the on Ondegas camped together. Nothing was said or done to evince treachery. Friends and enemies, Anna Ondega and Herons and white men, paddled and camped together for another week. But when, on August 3rd, four Huron warriors and two women forcibly seized a canoe and headed back for Montreal, the on Ondegas would delay no longer. That afternoon, as the Indians paddled inshore to camp on one of the thousand islands, some on Ondega braves rushed into the woods as if to hunt. As the canoes grated the pebbled shore, a secret signal was given. The Huron men, with their eyes bent on the beach, intent on landing, never knew that they had been struck. On Ondega hatchets, clubs, spears were plied from the waterside and from the hunters ambushed on shore crashed musketry that mowed down those who would have fled to the woods. By night time only a few Huron women and the French had survived the massacre. Such was the baptism of blood that inaugurated the French colony at Onondaga. Luckily the fort built on the crest of the hill above Lake Onondaga was large enough to house stock and provisions. Outside the palisades there daily gathered more Iroquois warriors, who no longer dissembled a hunger for Jesuits' preaching. Among the warriors were Radisson's old friends of the Mohawks, and his foster father confessed to him frankly that the Confederacy were only delaying the massacre of the French till they could somehow obtain the freedom of the twelve Iroquois hostages held at Quebec. Daily more warriors gathered, nightly the war drum pounded. Week after week the beleaguered and imprisoned French heard their stealthy enemy closing nearer and nearer on them, and the painted foliage of autumn frosts gave place to the leafless trees and the drifting snows of midwinter. The French were hemmed in completely, as if on a desert isle, and no help could come from Quebec where New France was literally under Iroquois siege. The question was, what to do? Messengers had been secretly sent to Quebec, but the Mohawks had caught the scouts bringing back answers, and there was no safe escape from the colony through ambushed woods in midwinter. The Iroquois could afford to bid their time for victims who could not escape. All winter the whites secretly built boats in the lofts of the fort, but when the timbers were put together, the boats had to be brought downstairs. And a Huron convert spread a terrifying report of a second deluge for which the white men were preparing a second Noah's Ark. Mohawk warriors at once scented an attempt to escape when the ice broke up in spring and placed their braves in ambush along the portages. Also, they sent a deputation to see if that story of the boats were true. Forewarned by Radisson, the whites built a floor over the boats, heaping canoes above the floor, and invited the Mohawk spies in. The Mohawks smiled grimly and were reassured. Canoes would be ripped into shingles if they ran the ice jam in spring. The Iroquois felt doubly certain of their victims, but Radisson, free to go among the warriors as one of themselves, learned that they were plotting to murder half the colony and hold the other half as hostages for the safety of the twelve Indians in the dungeon at Quebec. The whites could delay no longer. Something must be done. But what? Radisson, knowing the Indian customs, proposed a way out. No normally built savage could refuse an invitation to a scumptious feast. According to Indian custom, no feaster dare leave uneaten food on his plate. Waste to the Indian is crime. In the words of the Scottish proverb, better burst than waste, and all Indians have implicit faith in dreams. Radisson dreamed, so he told the Indians, that the white men were to give them a marvelous banquet. No sooner dreamed than done. 
the iroquois probably thought it a chance to obtain possession inside the fort but the whites had taken good care to set the banquet between inner and outer walls such a repast no savage had ever enjoyed in the memory of the race all the ambushed spies flocked in from the portages the painted warriors washed off their grease donned their best buttskin and rallied to the banquet as to battle all the stock but one solitary pig a few chickens and dogs had been slaughtered for the kettle such an odor of luscious meat steamed up from the fort for days as whetted the warriors hunger to the appetite of ravenous wolves finally one night the trumpets blew a blare that almost burst eardrums fife shrilled and the rub a dub dub of dozen drums set the air in a tremor a great fire had been kindled between the inner and outer walls that set shadows dancing in the forest then the gates were thrown open and in trooped the feasters all the french acting as waiters the whites carried in the kettles kettles of wild fowl kettles of oxen kettles of dogs kettles of porridge and potatoes and corn and what not that is it what not were the kettles drugged who knows the feasters ate till their eyes were rolling lugubriously and still the kettles came round the indians ate till they were torpid as swollen corpses and still came the white men with more kettles while the mischievous french lad radisson danced a mad jig shouting yelling eat eat beat the drum awake awake cheer up eat eat by midnight every soul of the feast had tumbled over sound asleep and at the rear gates were the french stepping noiselessly speaking in whispers launching their boats loaded with provisions and ammunition the soldiers were for going back and butchering every warrior but the jesuits forbade such treachery then radisson light-spirited as if the refugees had been setting out on a holiday perpetuated yet a last trick on the warriors to the bell rope of the main gate he fastened a pig so when the indians would pull the rope for admission they would hear the tramp of a sentry inside then he stuffed effigies of men on guard round the windows of the fort it was a pitchy sleety night the river roaring with the loose ice of spring flood the forest noisy with the boisterous march wind out on the maelstrom of ice and flood launched the fifty-three colonists march twentieth sixteen fifty eight by april they were safe inside the walls of quebec and chance hunters brought word that what with sleep and the measured tramp tramp of the pig and the baying of the dogs and the clucking of the chickens inside the fort the escape of the whites had not been discovered for a week the indians thought the whites had gone into retreat for especially long prayers then a warrior climbed the inner palisades and rage knew no bounds the fort was looted and burnt to the ground peltry traffic was the life of new france without it the colony would have perished and now the rupture of peace with the iroquois cut off that traffic to the iroquois land south of the st lawrence the french dared not go and the land of the hurons was a devastated wilderness the boats that came out to new france were compelled to return without a single peltry but there still remained the unknown land of the algonquin northwest and beyond the great lakes year after year french adventurers essayed the exploration of that land in sixteen thirty four jean nicolette one of champlain's wood runners had gone westward as far as green bay and coasted the shores of lake michigan jesuits where they practiced on lake superior had been told of a vast land beyond the sweet water seas great lakes a land where wandered tribes of warriors powerful as the iroquois yearly when the algonquins came down the ottawa to trade jesuits and young french adventurers accompanied the canoes back up the ottawa hoping to reach the unknown land which rumor said was bounded only by the western sea however the priests went no farther than lake nipsing 
but two nameless French wood runners came back from Green Bay in August of 1656 with marvelous tales of wandering hunters to the north called Christine's trees, who passed the winter hunting buffalo on a land bare of trees, the prairie, and the summer fishing on the shores of the North Sea, Hudson's Bay. They told also of fierce tribes south of the Christines, the Sioux, who traded with the Indians of the Spanish settlements in Mexico. All New France became fired by these reports. When Radisson returned from Onondaga in April of 1659, he found his brother-in-law, Short Gossier, just back from Nipsing, where he had been serving the Jesuits with more tales of this marvelous undiscovered land. The two kinsmen decided to go back with the Algonquins that very year, for, confessed Radisson in his journal, I long to see myself again in a boat. Thirty other Frenchmen and two Jesuits had assembled in Montreal to join the Algonquins. More than sixty canoes set out from Montreal in June. The one hundred and forty Algonquins, well supplied with firearms to defend themselves from marsuiting Iroquois. Numbers begot courage, courage carelessness, and before the fleet had reached the Chaudiere Falls at the modern city of Ottawa, the canoes had spread far apart in utter forgetfulness of danger. Not twenty were within calling distance when an Indian prophet or wandering medicine man ran down to the shore, throwing his blanket and hatchet aside as a signal of peace, shouting out warning of Iroquois warriors ambushed farther up the river. Drunk with the new sense of power from the possession of French firearms, perhaps drunk too with french brandy obtained at montreal the algonquins paused to take the strange captive on board and return thanks for the friendly warning by calling their benefactor a coward and dog and hen at the same time they took the precaution of sleeping in midstream with their canoes abreast and tied to waterlogged trees a dull roar through the night mist foretold they were nearing the great Chaudiere Falls, and at first streak of day dawn there was a rush to land and cross the long portage before the mist lifted and exposed them to the hostilities. End of section eleven. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 12 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. From 1650 to 1672, Part 2. To anyone who knows the region of Canada's capital, the scene can easily be recalled. The long string of canoes gliding through the gray morning like phantoms. Redu Falls shimmering on the left like a snowy curtain. The dense green of Gatineau Point as the birch craft swerved across the river inshore to the right. The wooded heights, now known as Parliament Hill, jutting above the river mist the new foliage of the topmost trees just tipped with the first primrose shafts of sunrise, then the vague stir and unrest in the air as the sun came up till the gray fog became rose and mist shot with gold, and rose like a curtain to the upper airs, revealing the angry tempest-tossed cataract straight ahead, hurling over the rocks of the Chandier in rawls of living waters, where the lumber piles of Hull on the right today jut out as if to span Ottawa River to Parliament Hill, the voyageurs would land to portage across to Lake Duchesne. De Just as they sheared inshore, the morning air was split by a hideous din of guns and war whoops. The Iroquois had been lying in ambush at the portage. 
the Algonquins' bravado now became a panic. They abandoned canoes and baggage, threw themselves behind a windfall of trees, and poured a steady rain of bullets across the portage in order to permit the other canoes to come ashore. When the fog lifted, baggage and canoes lay scattered on the shore. Behind one barricade of logs lay the French and Algonquins. Behind another, the Iroquois, and woe betide the warrior who showed his head or dared to cross the open. All day the warriors kept up their crossfire. Thirteen Algonquins had perished, and the French were only waiting a chance to abandon the voyage. Luckily, that night was pitch dark. The Algonquin leader blew a long, low call through his birch trumpet. All hands rallied and rushed for the boats to cross the river. All the Frenchmen's baggage had been lost. Of the white adventurers, every soul turned back but Grazier and Radisson. The Algonquins now made up in caution what they had at first lacked. They voyaged only by night and hid by day. No campfires were kindled. No muskets were fired, even for game, and the paddlers were presently reduced to food of tripe de roche, green moss scraped from the rocks. Birch canoes could not cross Lake Huron in storm, so the Indians kept close to the south shore of Georgian Bay, winding among the pink granite islands, past the ruined Jesuit missions, across to the Straits of Mackinac, and on down Lake Michigan to Green Bay. But our mind was not to stay here, relates Radisson, but to know the remotest people. Sometime between April and July, 1659, the two white men had followed the Indian hunters across what is now the state of Wisconsin to a mighty river like the St. Lawrence. They had found the Mississippi, first of white men to view the waters since the treasure-seeking Spaniards of the south crossed the river. They had penetrated the unknown. They had discovered the great northwest, a world bountifully vast, so vast no man forever in the history of the human race need be dispossessed of his share of the earth. Something of the importance of the discovery seems to have impressed Radisson for he speaks of the folly of the European nations fighting for sterile, rocky provinces when here is land enough for all, land enough to banish poverty. The two Frenchmen's wanderings with the tribes of the prairie, whether those tribes were Omahas or Iowas or Madanes or Mascoutins or Sioux, cannot be told here. It would fill volumes. I have told the story fully elsewhere. By spring of 1660, Radisson and Grazier are back at Salt St. Marie, having gathered wealth of beaver peltries beyond the dreams of avarice. But scouts have come to the Salt with ominous news, news of 1,000 Iroquois braves on the warpath to destroy every settlement in New France. Hourly, daily, weekly have Quebec and Three Rivers and Montreal been awaiting the blow. The Algonquins refuse to go down to Quebec with Radisson and Grazier. Fools, shouts Radisson in full assembly of their chiefs squatting round a council fire. Are you going to allow the Iroquois to destroy you as they destroyed the Hurons? How are you going to fight the Iroquois unless you come down to Quebec for guns? Do you want to see your wives and children slaves? For my part, I prefer to die like a man rather than live like a slave. The chiefs were shamed out of their cowardice. Five hundred young warriors undertook to conduct the two white men down to Quebec. They embarked at once, scouts to the fore reconnoitering all portages, and guards on duty whenever the boats landed. A few Iroquois braves were seen near the long salt rapids, but they took to their heels in such evident fright that Radisson was puzzled to know what had become of the one thousand braves on the warpath. Carrying the beaver pelts along the portage so they could be used as shields in case of attack, the Algonquins came to the foot 
of the Long Salt Rapids near Montreal and saw plainly what had happened to the invading warriors. A barricade of logs the shape of a square fort stood on the shore. From the pickets hung the scalps of dead Indians, and on the sands laid the charred remains of white men. Every tree for yards round was peppered with bullet holes. Here was a charred stake where some victim had been tortured, there the smashed remnants of half-burnt canoes, and in another point empty powder barrels. A terrible battle had been waged but a week before. Radisson could trace, inside the barricade of logs, holes scooped in the sand where the besieged, desperate with thirst, had drunk the muddy water. At intervals in the palisades openings had been hacked, and these were blood-stained, as if the scene of the fiercest fighting. Bark had been burnt from the logs in places where the assailants had set fire to the fort. From Indian refugees at Montreal, Radisson learned details of the fight. It was the battle most famous in early Canadian annals, the Long Salt. All winter Quebec, Three Rivers, and Montreal had cowered in terror of the coming Iroquois. In imagination, the beleaguered garrisons foresaw themselves martyrs of Mohawk ferocity. It was learned that seven hundred of the Iroquois warriors were hovering round the Richelieu opposite Three Rivers. The rest of the braves had passed the winter man-hunting in Huron country, and were in spring descending the Ottawa to unite with the lower band. Week after week, Quebec awaited the blow but the blow never fell, for at Montreal was a little band of seventeen heroes, led by a youth of twenty-five, Adam Dollard, who longed to wipe out the stain of a misspent boyhood by some glorious exploit in the service of the Holy Cross. When word came that the upper foragers were descending from the country of the Hurons, to unite with the lower Iroquois against Montreal, Dollard proposed to go up the Ottawa with a picked party of chosen fighters, waylay the Iroquois at the foot of the Long Salt Rapids, and so prevent the attack on Montreal. Sixteen young men volunteered to join him. Charles Lemoy, now acting as interpreter at Montreal, begged the young heroes to delay till reinforcements could be obtained. Seventeen Frenchmen against five hundred Mohawks meant certain death. But delay meant risk, and Dollard coveted nothing more than a death of glory. At the chapel of the Hotel Dieu, the young heroes made what they knew would certainly be their last confession, bade eternal farewell to friends, and with crushed corn for provisions, set out in canoes for the upper Ottawa. May 1st they came to the foot of the Long Salt. Here a barricade of logs had been erected in some skirmish the year before, and here, too, was the usual camping place of the Iroquois as their canoes came bounding down the swift waters of the Ottawa. Dollard and his brave boys landed, slung their kettles for the night meal, and sent scouts upstream to forewarn when the Iroquois came. The night was passed in prayer. Next day arrived unexpected reinforcements. Two bands of forty Hurons and four Algonquins, under a brave Huron convert of the Christian islands, had asked Missinu's permission to join Dollard and wreak their pent vengeance on the Mohawks. Early one morning the scouts reported five Iroquois canoes coming slowly downstream and two hundred more warriors behind. There was not even care to bring a supply of water inside the barricade, or remove kettles from the sticks. Posted in ambush, the young soldiers fired as soon as the first canoes came within range. This put the rest of the Iroquois on guard. The whites rushed for the shelter of their barricade. The Indians dashed to erect a fort of their own, Inside Dollar's palisades all was activity. Cracks were plastered up with mud between logs. Four marksmen with double stands of arms 
posted at each loophole, and a big musketeen leveled straight for the Iroquois redoubt. The Iroquois rushed out yelling like fiends and jumping sideways as they advanced to avoid becoming targets, but the scattering fire of the musketeen caught them all abreast, and a Seneca chief fell dead. The Iroquois then broke up Dollard's canoes and tried to set fire to the logs, but again the musketeen scattered bullets mowed a swath of death in the advancing ranks, and for a second time the red warriors sought shelter behind the logs, probably to obtain truce till they could send word to the other warriors on the Richelieu. The Iroquois then hung out a flag of parley, but the Huron chief knew what peace with an Iroquois meant. He it was on the Christian islands who, when the Iroquois had proposed a similar parley for the purpose of massacring the Hurons, invited their chiefs into the Huron camp and brained them for their treachery. Dollard's band made an answer to the flag hoisted above the Iroquois pickets by rushing out, securing the head of the Seneca chief, and elevating it on a pike above their fort. But as the fight went on, the whites had to have water, and a few rushed for the river to fill kettles. This rejoiced the hearts of the Iroquois. They could guess if the whites were short of water. It only required more warriors to surround the barricade completely and compel the surrender. Scouts had meanwhile gone for the Iroquois at Richelieu, and on the fifth day of the siege, a roar, gathering volume as it approached, told Dollard that seven hundred warriors were coming through the forest. Among the newcomers were Huron renegades, who approached within speaking distance of the fort and called out for the Hurons to save themselves from death by surrender. Death was plainly inevitable, and all the Hurons but the chief deserted. This reduced Dollard's band from sixty to twenty. The whites were now weak from lack of food and sleep, but for three more days and nights the marksmen and musketoon plied such deadly aim at the assailants that the Iroquois actually held a council whether they should retire. The Iroquois chiefs argued that it would disgrace the nation forever if one thousand of their warriors were to retire before a handful of beardless white boys. Solemnly the bundle of war sticks was thrown on the ground, that each warrior willing to go on with the siege picked up a stick. The chiefs chose first, and the rest were shamed into doing likewise. Inside the fort, Dollard's men were at the last extremities. Blistered and blackened with powder smoke, the fevered men were half delirious from lack of sleep and water. Some fell to their knees and prayed. Others staggered with sleep where they stood. Others had not strength to stand and sank, muttering prayers to their knees. The Iroquois were adopting new tactics. They could not reach the palisades in the face of the withering fire from the musketoon, so they constructed a movable palisade of trees behind which marched the entire band of warriors. In vain, Dollard's marksmen aimed their bullets at the front carriers. Where one fell, another stepped in his place. Desperate, Dollard resolved on a last expedient. Some accounts say he took a barrel of powder, others that he wrapped powder in a huge bowl of birch bark. Putting a light to this, he threw it with all his might, but his strength had failed. The dangerous projectile fell back inside the barricade. Exploding, marksmen were driven from their places. A moment later, the Iroquois were inside the barricade, screeching like demons. They found only three Frenchmen alive. So great was the Mohawk rage to be foiled of victims that they fell on the Huron renegades in their own ranks and put them to death on the spot. Such was the battle of the Long Salt, of which Radisson saw the scars on his way down the Ottawa. It saved New France. If seventeen boys could fight in this fashion, how, 
the Iroquois asked, would a fort full of men fight? A few days later Radisson was conducted in triumph through the streets of Quebec and personally welcomed by the new governor, de Argenson. It can be well imagined that Radisson's account of the vast new lands discovered by him aroused enthusiasm at Quebec. Among the Crees, Radisson and Grosier had heard of the Sea of the North, Hudson Bay, to which Champlain had tried to go by way of the Ottawa. The Indians had promised to conduct the two Frenchmen overland to the North Sea, but Radisson deemed it wise not to reveal this fact lest other voyageurs should forestall them. Somehow the secret leaked out. Either Grossier told it, or his wife dropped some hint of it to her father, confessor. But the two explorers were amazed to receive official orders to conduct the Jesuits to the North Sea by way of the Sanguinet. They refused point-blank to go as subordinates on any expedition. The fur trade was at this time regulated by license. Anyone who proceeded to the woods without license was liable to imprisonment, the galleys for life, death if the offense were repeated. Radisson and Grosier asked for a license to go north in 1661. De Avenure, a bluff soldier who had become governor, would grant it only on condition of receiving half the profits. Grosier and Radisson set off by night without a license. This time the Indian canoes struck off into Lake Superior instead of Lake Michigan, and coasted that billowy island sea with its iron shore and shadowy forests. On the northwest side of the lake, somewhere between Duluth and Fort William, the explorers joined the Crees and proceeded northwestward with them hunting along that Indian trail to become famous as the Fur Traders Highway, from Lake Superior to the Lake of the Woods. The first white men's fort built west of the Great Lakes, the terrible famine that winter, and the visits of the Sioux are all a story in themselves. Spring found the explorers following the Crees over the height of land from Lake Superior to Hudson Bay. As soon as the ice loosened, dugouts were launched, and the voyageurs began the hardest of all canoe trips in America, through the forest hinterland of Ontario. Here the rivers were a stagnant marsh, with outlet hidden by the dankest forest growth, where the light of the sun never penetrated. There the water swollen by spring thaw and broken by the ice jam whirled the boats into rapids before the paddlers realized. There was wading to mid-waist in ice water. There were nights when camp was made on water-soaked moss. There were days when the windfall compelled the canoemen to take the canoes out of the water and carry them half the time. At last, writes Radisson, we came to the sea where we found an old house all demolished and battered with bullets. The Crees told us about European being here, and we went from isle to isle all that summer. At this time the canoes must have been coasting the south shore of Jane's Bay, headed east, for Radisson presently explains that they came to a river which rose in a lake near the source of the Saguenay, namely Rupert River. What was the old house battered with bullets? Was it Hudson's winter fort of 1610 to 1611? The Indians of Rupert River to this day have legends of Hudson having come back to his fort when cast away by the mutineers. The furs that Radisson and Grosier brought back from the north this time were worth fabulous wealth. The cargo saved New France from bankruptcy, but the explorers had defied both church and governor, and all the greedy monopolists of Quebec fell on Radisson and Grosier with jealous fury. They were fined twenty thousand dollars to build a fort at Three Rivers, though given permission to inscribe their coats of arms on the gate. A thirty thousand dollar fine went to the public treasury of New France, 
and a tax of seventy thousand dollars was imposed by the farmers of the revenue of the total cargo there was left to radisson and Guazier only twenty thousand dollars disgusted the two explorers personally appealed to the court of france but there the monopolists were all powerful and justice was denied they tried to induce some of the fishing fleet off cape breton to venture to the north sea but there the monopolist malign influence was again felt they were accused of having broken the laws of quebec zachariah gillam a sea captain of boston who chanced to be at port royal offered them his vessel for a voyage to hudson bay but when the doughty captain came to the ice locked straits his courage failed and he refused to enter finally at port royal with the last of their meager and dwindling capital they hired two ships for a voyage but one was wrecked on sable island while fishing for supplies and instead of sailing for hudson bay in sixteen sixty five radisson and grazier were summoned to boston in a lawsuit over the lost vessel in boston they met commissioners of the english government and were invited to lay their plans before charles the second king of england at last the tide of fortune seemed to be turning sailing with sir george cartiet after pirate raid and shipwreck they reached london to find the plague raging and were ordered to windsor where charles received them recommended their venture to prince rupert and provided two pounds a week each for their living expenses from being penniless outcasts radisson and grazier suddenly wakened to find themselves famous grazier seemed to have kept in the background but radisson the younger man enjoyed the full blaze of glory was seen in the king's box at the theatre and was presently paying furious court to mistress mary kirk daughter of sir john kirk whose ancestors had captured quebec what with war and the plague it was sixteen sixty eight before the english admirally could loan the two ships eaglet and nonsuch for a voyage to hudson bay the expense was to be defrayed by a band of friends known as the gentlemen adventurers of england trading to hudson bay subscribing so much stock in cash provision and goods for trade radisson's ship the eaglet was driven back damaged by storm but the other under grazier went on to hudson bay where the marks set up on the overland voyage were found at rupert river and the small fort was built for trade during the delay radisson was not idle in london he wrote the journals of his first four voyages he married mary kirk some accounts say elope with her with the help of king charles and prince rupert he organized what is now known as the hudson's bay fur company for when grazier's ship returned in the fall of sixteen sixty nine his success in trade had been so great that the adventurers at once applied for royal charter of exclusive monopoly in trade to all the regions land and sea rivers and territories adjoining hudson bay the monopoly of the hudson's bay company to the great northwest was granted by king charles in may sixteen seventy here then was the situation england was entrenched south of the st lawrence england was taking armed possession of all lands bordering on hudson bay and such other lands as the adventurers might find wedge between was new france with a population of less than six thousand if france could have foreseen what her injustice to two poor adventurers would cost the nation in blood and money it would have paid her to pension radisson like a prince of the blood royal end of section twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 13 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1672 to 1688 part one while radisson and other couriers of the woods were ranging the wilds from st lawrence to the mississippi and from the great lakes to hudson bay changes were almost revolutionizing the little colony of new france no longer was everything subservient to missions when marguerite bourgois and Jean Mance of Ville Marie Mission at Montreal went home to France to bring out more colonists in 1659. They learned that the founder of their mission, Diversier, the tax collector, had gone bankrupt. Montreal was penniless. Though sixty more men and thirty-two girls were accompanying the nuns out this very year, the Sulpinian priest had from the first been ardent friends of the Montrealers. The priests of St. Sulpice now assumed charge of Montreal. Though God's penny was still collected at the fairs and marketplaces of old France for the conversion of Indians at Mount Royal, the fur trade was rapidly changing the character of the place. Afraid of the Iroquois raiders, the tribes of the up-country now flocked to Montreal instead of Quebec, where the traders met them annually at the great fur fairs. No more picturesque scene exists in Canada's past than these fur fairs. Down the rapids of the Ottawa and the St. Lawrence bounded the canoes of the Indian hunters, Hurons and Potawatomis from Lake Michigan. Crees and Obejays from Lake Superior, Iroquois and Eries and the Neutrals from what now is the province of Ontario, the northern Indians in long birch canoes light as paper, the Indians of Ontario in dugouts of oak and walnut. The fur fair usually took place between June and August, and the Viceroy, magnificent in red cloak, faced with velvet and ornamented with gold braid came up from quebec for the occasion and occupied the chair of state under a marquee erected near the indian tents wigwams then went up like mushrooms the huron and iroquois tents of sewed bark hung in the shape of a square from four poles the tepees of the upper indians made of birch and buffalo hides hung on poles criss-crossed at the top to a peak spreading in wide circle to the ground usually the fur fair occupied a great common between st paul street and the river furs unpacked there stalked among the tents great schemes glorious in robes of painted buckskin garnished with wampum indian children stark naked young braves flaunting and boastful wearing headdresses with strings of eagle quills reaching to the ground each quill signifying an enemy taken then came the peddlers the fur merchants unpacking their goods to tempt the indians men of the colonial noblesque famous in history the forests and le chenets and the bears here too gorgeous in finery bristling with firearms were the bush rovers the interpreters the french voyageurs who had come out of the wilds once every two years to renew their licenses to trade there was charles le moyne son of an innkeeper of dieppe who had come to montreal as interpreter and won such wealth as trader that his family became members of the french aristocracy two of his descendants became governors of canada and the history of his sons in the history of canada's most heroic age there was louis jolette who had studied for the jesuit priesthood but turned fur trader among the tribes of lake michigan there was daniel grayson duluth a man of good birth ample means and with the finest house in montreal 
who had turned bushrover, gathered round him a band of three or four hundred lawless, daredevil French hunters, and now roamed the woods from Detroit halfway to Hudson Bay, swaying the Indians in favor of France and ruling the wilds, sole lord of the wilderness. There were Grossier and Radisson and shy young man of twenty-five who had obtained a seigneury from the Sulpinians at Lachine, Robert Cavalier de Salle. Sometimes, too, Father Marquette came down with his Indians from the missions on Lake Superior. Masonev, too, was there, grieving, no doubt, to see this kingdom of heaven, which he had set up on earth, becoming more and more a kingdom of this world. Later, when the hundred associates lost their charter, and Canada became a royal province, governed directly by the crown, Masonev was deprived of the government of Montreal and retired to die in obscurity in Paris. Louis Laubuste, governor of Montreal, when Masonev is absent, governor at Quebec when state necessities drag him from religious devotion, moves also in the gay throng of the fur fair. In later days is a famous character at the fur fairs, La Motte Cadillac of Detroit, bushrover and gentleman like Duluth, but prone to break heads when he comes to town where the wine is good. Trade was regulated by royal license. Only twenty-five canoes a year were allowed to go to the woods with three men in each and a license was good for only two years. Fines, branding, the galleys for life, death, were the penalties for those who traded without license. But that did not prevent more than one thousand young Frenchmen running off to the woods to live like Indians. In fact, there was no other way for the youth of New France to earn a living. Penniless young noblemen criminals escaping the law, the sons of the poorest, all were on the same footing in the woods. He who could persuade a merchant to outfit him for trade disappeared into the wilds, and if he came back at all, came back with wealth, of furs and bought off punishment, wearing sword and lace and swaggering as if he were a gentleman, the annals of the day complained and a long session in the confessional box relieved the prodigal's conscience from the sins of a life in the woods. If my young gentleman were rich enough, the past was forgotten, and he was now on the high road to distinguished service, and perhaps a title. In the early days a beaver skin could be bought for a needle or a bell or a tin mirror, and in spite of all the priests could do to prevent it, Brandy played a shameful part in the trade. In vain the priests preached against it, and the bishop thundered anthemus. The evils of the brandy traffic were apparent to all. The fur fairs became a bedlam of crime, but when the governor called in all the traders to confer on the subject, it was plain that if the Indians did not obtain liquor from the French, they would go on down with their furs to the English of New York, and the French governor was afraid to forbid the evil. The fur fair over, the governor departed for Quebec, the Indians for their own land, the bush robbers for their far wanderings, and there settled over Montreal for another year drowsy quiet but for the chapel bells of St. Suplice and Ville Marie and Bon Secure, the chapel of St. Anne's good help, built close on the verge of the river, that the voyageurs coming and going might cross themselves as they passed her spire, drowsy peace but for the chapel chimes ringing, 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 morning, noon, and night lilting and singing and calling all new france to prayers as the last canoe glided up the river and sunset silence fell on montreal there knelt before the dimly lighted altars of the chapels shadow figures 
Masonneuve praying for his mission, de Allenboost asking heaven's blessing on the new shrine down at St. Anne de Beaupre near Quebec, which had been built for the miraculous healing of all physical ills. Dolier de Casson, priest of the wilds, manly and portly and strong, wilderness fighter for the cross. Then the organ swells and the chant rolls out until the next fur fair Montreal is again a mission. When New France becomes a crown colony, the government consists solely and only of the sovereign council, to whom the king transmits his will. This council consists of the governor, his administrative officer called the intendant, the bishop, and several of the inhabitants of New France nominated by other members of the council. Of elections there are absolutely none. Popular meetings are forbidden. New France is a despotism, with the sovereign council representing the king. Domestic disputes, religious quarrels, civil cases, crimes, all come before the sovereign council. Clients could plead their own cases without a fee, or hire a notary. Cases are tried by the sovereign council. Laws are passed by it. Fines are imposed and sentences pronounced. But as the sovereign council met only once a week, the management of affairs fell chiefly to the intendant, whose palace became known as the place of justice. Of systematic taxation there was none. One-fourth of all beaver went for public revenue. Part of Labrador was reserved as the king's domain for trading, and sometimes a duty of ten percent was charged on liquor brought into the colony. The stroke of the sovereign council's pen could create a law, and the stroke of the king's pen annul it. Laws are passed forbidding men who are not nobles, assuming the title of esquire or sieur on penalty of what would be a five hundred dollar fine. Wood is not to be piled in the streets. Chimneys are to be built large enough to admit a chimney sweep. Only shingles of oak and walnut may be used in towns where there is danger of fire. Swearing is punished by fines, by the disgrace of being led through the street at the end of a rope and begging pardon on knees at the church steps, by branding if the offense be repeated. Murderers are punished by being shot or exposed in an iron cage on the cliffs above the St. Lawrence till death comes. No detail is too small for the Sovereign Council's notice. In fact, a case is on record where a Mademoiselle André is expelled from the colony for flirting so outrageously with young officers that she demoralizes the garrison. Mademoiselle avoids the punishment by bribing one of the officers on the ship where she is placed, and escaping to land in man's clothing. The people of New France were regulated in every detail of their lives by the church as well as the sovereign council. For trading brandy to the Indians, Bishop Laval thunders excommunication as delinquents, and Bishop St. Valéry his successor publicly rebukes the dames of New France for wearing low neck dresses and curling their hair and donning gay ribbons in place of bonnets. The vanity of dress among women becomes a greater scandal than before, he complains. They affect immodest headdress with heads uncovered or only concealed under a collection of ribbons, laces, curls, and other vanities. The laws came from the king and sovereign council. The enforcement of them depended on the intendant. As long as he was a man of integrity, New France might live as happily as a family under a despotic but wise father. It was when the intendant became corrupt that the system fell to pieces. Of all the intendants of New France, one named stands preeminent, that of Jean Talon, who came to Canada, age forty, in 1665, 
at the time the country became a crown province. One of eleven children of Irish origin, Talon had been educated at the Jesuit College of Paris, and had served as an intendant in France before coming to Canada. Officially he was to stand between the king and the colony, to transmit the commands of one and the wants of the other. He was to stand between the governor and the colony, to watch that the governor did not overstep his authority and that the colony obeyed the laws. He was to stand between the church and the colony, to see that the church did not usurp the prerogatives of the governor, and that the people were kept in the path of right, living without having their natural liberties curtailed. He was, in a word, to accept the thankless task of taking all the cuffs from the king and the kicks from the colony, all the blame of whatever went amiss, and no credit for what went well. When Talon came to Canada, there were less than two thousand people in the colony. He wrote frantically to his royal master for colonists. We cannot depeople France to people Canada, wrote the king, but from his royal revenue he set aside money yearly to send men to Canada as soldiers, women as wives. In 1671, 165 girls were sent out to be wedded to the French youth. A year later came 150 more. Licenses would not be given to the wood rovers for the fur trade unless they married. Bachelors were fined unless they quickly chose a wife from among the king's girls. Promotion was withheld from the young ensigns and cadets in the army unless they found brides. Yearly the ships brought girls whom the curés of France had carefully selected in country parishes. Yearly Talon gave a bounty to the middle-aged duenna who had safely chaperoned her charges across seas to the convents of Quebec and Montreal, where the bashful suitors came to make choice. We want country girls who can work, wrote the intendant, and the girls who could work the king sent, instructing Talon to mate as many as he could to officers of the Kerrigan regiment, so that the soldiers would be likely to turn settlers. Results, by 1674 Canada had a population of 6,700, by 1684 of nearly 12,000, not counting the 1,000 bushlopers who roamed the woods and married squaws. Between Acadia and Quebec lay wilderness. Jean Talon opened a road connecting the two far separated provinces. The Sovereign Council had practically outlawed the bushlopers. Talon pronounced trade free and formed them into companies of bush fighters, defenders of the colony. Instead of being wild wood bandits, men like the Duluth at Lake Superior and Lamotte Cadillac at Detroit became commanders, holding vast tribes loyal to France. For years there had been legends of mines. Talon opened mines at Gaspé and Three Rivers and Cape Breton. All clothing had formerly been imported from France. Talon had the inhabitants taught and they badly needed it, for many of their children ran naked as Indians, to weave their own clothes, make rugs, tan leather, grow straw for hats, all of which they do to this day, so that you may enter a habitat house and not find a single article except saints' images, a holy book, and perhaps a fiddle, which the habitant has not himself made. The Jesuits assumed too much authority, wrote the king. Talon lessened their power by inviting the Recollects to come back to Canada and encouraging the Sulpinians. Instead of outlawing young Frenchmen for deserting to the English, Talon asked the king to grant titles of nobility to those who were loyal, like the Godfrey and the Denis and the Les Moines and young Schwartz Gossier, 
son of Radisson's brother-in-law, so that there sprang up a Canadian noblesse which was as graceful with the frying pan of a night camp fire in the woods as with the steps of a stately dance in the governor's ballroom above all did talon encourage the bushrovers in their far wanderings to explore new lands for france end of section 13 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section number 14 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. From 1672 to 1688. Part two. New France had not forgotten the Iroquois treachery to the French colony at Onondaga. Iroquois raid and ambuscade kept the hostility of these sleepless foes fresh in French memory. When Jean Talon came to Canada as intendant, there had come as governor Courcel, with the Marquis de Tracy as major general of all the French forces in America the West Indies as well as Canada. The Carrigan Regiment of soldiers seasoned in European campaigns had been sent to protect the colonists from Indian raid, and it was determined to strike the Iroquois Confederacy a blow that would forever put the fear of the French in their hearts. Richelieu River was still the trail of the Mohawk warrior and de tracy sent his soldiers to build forts on this stream at sorel and chambly named after officers of the regiment january sixteen sixty six courcel the governor set out on snowshoes to invade the iroquois country with five hundred men half canadian bushrovers half regular soldiers by some mistake the snow-covered trail to the mohawks was missed the wrong road followed, and the French governor found himself among the Dutch at Chenectady. March rains had set in. Through the leafless forests, in driving sleet and rain retreated the French. Sixty had perished from exposure and disease before Courcel led his men back to the Richelieu. The Mohawk warriors showed their contempt for this kind of white man warfare by raiding some French hunters on Lake Champlain and killing a young nephew of de Tracy. Nevertheless, on second thought, twenty-four Indian deputies proceeded to Quebec with the surviving captives to sue for peace. De Tracy was ready for them. Solemnly the peace pipe had been puffed, and solemnly the peace powwow held. The Mohawk chief was received in pompous state at the governor's table heated with wine and mistaking french courtesy for fear the warrior grew boastful at the wife chief's table this is the hand he exclaimed proudly stretching out his right arm this is the hand that split the head of your young man on ontio then by the power of heaven thundered the marquis de tracy springing to his feet ablaze with indignation it is the hand that shall never split another head. Forthwith the body of the great Mohawk chief dangled a scarecrow to the fowls of the air, and the other terrified deputies tore breathlessly back for the Iroquois land with such a story as one may guess. With thirteen hundred men and three hundred boats, the Marquis de Tracy and Courcel set out from the St. Lawrence in October for the Iroquois cantons. Charles Le Moy, the Montreal bushrover, led six hundred wildwood followers in their buckskin coats and beaded moccasins with hair flying to the wind like Indians, and one hundred Huron braves were also in line with the Canadians. The rest of the forces were of the Cardigan Regiment, Dollier de Casson, the Sulpinian priest, 
powerful a frame as de tracy himself marched as champlain never had such an expedition been seen before on the st lawrence drums beat reveille at peep of dawn fifes outshrilled the roar of rapids and stately figures in gold braid and plumed hats glided over waters of the richelieu among the painted forests of the frost-tinted maples indians have a way of conveying news that modern trappers designate as the moccasin telegram moccasin telegram now carried news of the coming army to the iroquois villages and the alarm ran like wildfire from mohawk to onondaga and from onondaga to seneca while the french army struck up the mohawk river and to beat of drum charged in full fury out of the rain-dripping forest across the stubble fields to attack the first palisaded village they found it desolate deserted silent as the dead though winter stores crammed the abandoned houses and wildest confusion showed that the warriors had fled in panic so it was with the next village and the next the iroquois had stampeded in blind flight and the only show of opposition was a wild whoop here and there from ambush de tracy took possession of the land for france planted a cross and ordered the villages set on fire for a time at least peace was assured with the iroquois who first discovered the province of ontario before champlain had ascended the ottawa or the jesuits established their missions south of lake huron young men sent out as wood rovers had canoed up the ottawa and gone westward to the land of the sweet water seas was it Vigneau, the romancer, or Nicolette, the courier de bois, or the boy Etienne Brule, who first saw what had been called the Garden of Canada, the rolling meadows and wooded hills that lie wedged in between the upper and lower of the Great Lakes? Tradition says it was Brule, but however that may be, little was known of what is now Ontario except in the region of the old Jesuit missions around Georgian Bay. It was not even known that Michigan and Huron were two lakes. The Sulpinians of Montreal had a mission at the Bay of Quinte on Lake Ontario, and the south shore of the lake, where it touched on Iroquois territory, was known to the Jesuits. But from Quinte Bay to Detroit, a distance equal to that from New York to Chicago, or London to Italy, was an unknown world but to return to the explorations where jean talon the intendant had set in motion where dollier de casson the soldier who becomes sulpinian priest returned from the campaign against the iroquois he had been sent as a missionary to the nipsing country there he heard among the indians of a shorter route to the great river of the west the mississippi than by the ottawa and the salt st marie indians told him if he would ascend the st lawrence to lake ontario and lake erie he could portage overland to the beautiful river ohio which would carry him down to the mississippi the sulpinians had been encouraged by talon in order to eclipse and hold in check the jesuits they were eager to send their missionaries to the new realm of this great river and hurried dollier de casson down to quebec to obtain intendant talon's permission there curiously enough dollier de casson met cavalier de la salle the shy young seigneur of la chan intent on almost the same aim to explore the great river where the sulpinians had granted him his seigneury above montreal he had built a fort which soon won the nickname of la Chien, china because its young master was continually entertaining iroquois indians within the walls to question them of the great river which might lead to china governor Cressel and intendant talon ordered the priest and young seigneur to set out together on their explorations the sulpinians were to bear all expenses 
buying back La Salle's lands to enable him to outfit canoes with the money. Father Gallinet, who understood map-making, accompanied Dollier de Casson, and the expedition of seven birch canoes, with three white men each, and two dugouts with Seneca Indians, who had been visiting La Salle, set out from Montreal on July 6, 1669. Not a leader in the party was over thirty-five years of age. Dollier de Casson, the big priest, was only thirty-three, and La Salle barely twenty-six. Cornmeal was carried as food. For the rest, they were to depend on chance shots. With numerous portages, keeping to the south shore of the St. Lawrence, because that was best known to the Seneca guides, the canoes passed up Lake St. Louis and Lake St. Francis and glided through the Sylvian fairyland of the Thousand Islands, coming out in August on Lake Ontario, which, says Gallinet, appeared to us like a great sea. Striking south, they appealed to the Seneca Iroquois for guides to the Ohio, but the Senecas were so intent on torturing some prisoners recently captured that they paid no heed to the appeal. A month was wasted, and the white men proceeded with Indian slaves for guides, still along the south shore of the lake. At the mouth of the Niagara River they could hear the far roar of the famous falls, which Indian legend said fell over rocks twice the height of the highest pine tree. The turbulent torrent of the river could not be breasted, so they did not see the falls, but rounded up Lake Ontario to the region now near the city of Hamilton. Here they had prepared to portage overland to some stream that would bring them down to Lake Erie, when, to their amazement, they learned from a passing Indian camp that two Frenchmen were on their way down this very lake from searching copper mines on Lake Superior. The two Frenchmen were Louis Jolet, yet in his early twenties to become famous as an explorer of the Mississippi, and one Monsieur Jean Paré, soldier of fortune, who was to set France and England by the ears on Hudson Bay. September 24th, as La Salle and Dollier were dragging their canoes through the autumn-colored sumacs of the swamp, there plunged from among the russet undergrowth the two wanderers from the north, Jolet and Perret. Dumb with amazement to meet a score of men toiling through this talentless wilderness, the two parties fell on each other's necks with the light and camped together. Jolet told a story that set missionary zeal on fire and inflamed La Salle with mad eagerness to pass on to the goal of his discoveries. Joliet and Perry had not found the copper mine for Talon on Lake Superior, but they had learnt two important secrets from the Indians. First, if Iroquois blocked the way up the Ottawa, there was clear, easy water way down to Quebec by Lake Huron and Lake St. Clair, and Lake Erie, Joliet's guide had brought them down this way, first of white men to traverse the Great Lakes, only leaving them as they reached Lake Erie and advising them to portage across up Grand River to avoid Niagara Falls. Second, the Indians told him the Ohio could be reached by way of Lake Erie. Sitting round the campfires near what is now Port Stanley, La Salle secretly resolved to go on down to Quebec with Joliet and rearrange his plans independent of the missionaries. The portaging through swamps had affected La Salle's health, and he probably judged he could make quicker time unaccompanied by missionaries. As for Gallinet and Dollier, when they knelt in prayer that night, they fervently besought heaven to let them carry the gospel of truth to those benighted heathen west of Lake Michigan, of whom Joliet told. Dollier de Casson sent a letter by Joliet to Montreal, begging the Sulpinians to establish a mission near what is now Toronto. Early next morning an altar was laid on the prop paddles of the canoes and solemn service held. 
La Salle and his four canoes went back to Montreal with Joliet and Perry. Dolier and Galigny coasted along the shores of Lake Erie westward. It was October. The forests were leafless, the weather damp, the lake too stormy for the frail canoes. As game was plentiful, the priests decided to winter on a creek near Port Dover. Here log houses were knocked up and the servants dispersed moose hunting for winter supplies. Then followed the most beautiful season of the year in the peninsula of Ontario, Indian summer, dreamy warm days after the first cold, filling the forest with shimmer of golden light, the hills with heat haze, while the air was odorous with smells of nuts and dried leaves and grapes hanging thick from wild vines. It was, writes Galinet, simply an earthly paradise, the most beautiful region that ever I have seen in my life, with open woods and meadows and rivers and game in plenty. In this earthly paradise the priests passed the winter, holding services three times a week, a winter that ought to be worth ten years of any other kind of life, Dolier calculated, counting up masses and vespers and matins sometimes when the snow lay deep and the weird voices of the wind hallooed with bugle sound through the lonely forest the priests listening inside fancied that they heard the hunting of arthur unearthly huntsman coursing the air after unearthly game march twenty third sunday sixteen seventy the company paraded down to lake erie from their sheltered quarters and erecting a cross took possession of this land for france then they launched their boats to ascend the other sweet water seas the preceding autumn the priests had lost some of their baggage and now in camp near port pele a sweeping wave carried off the packs in, in which were all the holy vessels and equipments for the mission chapel they decided to go back to montreal by way of salt st marie and ascended to Lake St. Clair. Game had been scarce for some days, the weather tempestuous, and now the priests thought they had found the cause. On one of the rocks of Lake St. Clair was a stone to which the Indians offered sacrifices for safe passage on the lakes. To the priests the rude drawing of a face seemed graven images of paganism, signs of Satan, who had baffled their hunting and caused loss of their packs. I consecrated one of my axes to break this god of stone, and having yoked our canoes abreast, we carried the largest pieces to the middle of the river and cast them in. God immediately rewarded us, for we killed a deer. Following the east shore of Lake Huron, the priests came on May 25th to Salt St. Marie, where the Jesuits Dabon and Marquette had a mission. Three days later they embarked by way of the Ottawa for Montreal, where they arrived on June 18, 1670. Meanwhile, what had become of Joliet and Pere and La Salle? They have no sooner reached Quebec with their report than Talon orders St. Luzon to go north and take possession at Salt St. Marie of all the unknown lands for France. Joliet accompanies St. Luzon. Nicholas Perrault, a famous bush rover, goes along to summon the Indians, and the ceremony takes place on June 14, 1671, in the presence of the Jesuits at the Salt, by which the King of France is pronounced Lord Paramount of all these regions. When Joliet comes down again to Quebec, he founds Count Frontenac has come as governor, and Jean Talon, the intendant, is sailing for France. Before leaving, Talon has recommended Joliet as a fit man to explore the great river of the west. With him is commissioned Jacques Marquette, the Jesuit, who has labored among the Indians west of Lake Superior. The two men set out in birch canoes with smoked meat for provisions from Michilmicamac Mission, May 17, 1673, for Green Bay, Lake Michigan. Ascending Fox River on June 17th, 
they induce the Mascoutin Indians, who had years ago conducted Radisson by this same route, to pilot them across the portage to the headwaters of the Wisconsin River. Their way lies directly across that wooded lake region, which has in our generation become the resort first of the lumbermen, then of the tourist, a rolling wooded region of rare sylvan beauty, park-like forests interspersed with sky-colored lakes. Six weeks from the time they had left the salt, Wisconsin River carried their canoe out on the swift eddies of a mighty river flowing south, the Mississippi. For the first time the boat of a Canadian voyageur glided down its waters. Each night as the explorers landed to sleep under the stars, the tilted canoe inverted with end on a log as roof in case of rain, Marquette fell to knees and invoked the Virgin's aid on the expedition, and each morning as Joliet launched the boat out on the waters through the early mist, he headed closely along shore on the watch for sign or footprint of Indian. End of section 14. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.